My name is Josh Royt, Senior Scientist for the Nature Conservancy in the U.S. State of Maine. I serve on the advisory board of the World Fish Migration Foundation, which produces World Fish Migration Day, from sea to source guidance books, and many other projects that connect people to rivers and gives them the tools to understand, promote, and restore rivers to their natural free-flowing state. This is World Fish Migration Day. Have you heard about it? And even more, did you know that nearly all fish travel throughout their rivers, some up and downstream, some go to the ocean, and then thousands of miles beyond before returning back to their streams? Did you know that once upon a time, massive fish migrations was something that happened all around the world yearly? People and wildlife evolved around these natural wonders. They depended on the cycle of life. And now that dams and other barriers nearly wiped them out, we're turning the corner. We're starting to bring these migrations back. World Fish Migration Day was created to reconnect people to our rivers, to excite both fishers and decision makers to the wonders of our rivers. Ultimately, we want to help find a path to restore fish passage and protect rivers that haven't lost their connections yet. This celebration has grown so big, it's really surprised us all. The feedback from thousands of people in dozens of countries around the world makes us realize there's a much larger importance here of connecting passionate people together to hear each other's stories and to learn how to support each other's river restoration work. After working so intently with the amazing World Fish Migration Team, I realized I needed to get myself out on the ground and by the water to see these celebrations in person. I celebrated World Fish Migration Day in Richmond, Virginia. Richmond, like so many cities around the world, was built on a river. In this case, it was the historic James River, just a few hours southwest of our nation's capital. And this is a place where the right mix of people were able to pull together a really fun and uplifting event. So you decided, maybe not out of the blue, to host a World Fish Migration Day event here near Richmond. How did that happen? I do river restoration as my job and as part of that I started doing fish passage work and uh, many years ago I started going to the uh, fish passage conference that was out of Amherst and I started hearing about this event while attending that conference and uh, I got more involved with the, the committees that uh, helped establish that conference and uh, so being on that national committee and just becoming more and more aware of it. It was in 2016 when they had the happy fish at the conference yeah. I was like this is awesome. Oh, that's great. I, I, I've, I've got to host one of these in, in my town. Oh, good for you. Yeah. Kathy Hoverman from KCI had assembled a many parted event with help from James River Association, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and Virginia Game and Fisheries, and also American Rivers. Kathy is just one of those rare people with this mix of solid engineering chops, ecological know how, and a passion for rivers and ability to make things happen. And what? Got you even interested in, in rivers and fish to begin with? Has this always been a passion of yours? Or? Well, it was a discovered passion. I, I'd say I, I always loved being outside and in nature and hiking and just being athletic outside. Yeah. Uh, and then when I started studying engineering in school, I realized there was kind of something missing from mm -hmm. civil engineering for me. Wastewater and drinking water just didn't have a spark to it. So I picked up a, a conservation degree and while doing that, I took an ecology class. Excellent. And rivers was a, a featured system of that ecology class. And from there, I just, I quit my job in the concrete lab. I started working for the ecology professor and uh, it just took off from there. And so it was, cool. I, it was ready to be made. I just needed the right, the right spark to really lead me in that direction. While Kathy and the James River event partners were preparing themselves for this long day of multiple events on the river, there are hundreds of other events going on around the world. For World Fish Migration Day 2018, we decided to have regional hubs, headquarters that could bring together information from events all around each of the continents. The James River event in Virginia was the hub for North America. In Europe, the hub was Finland. This included a full day of conferences led by WWF Finland, with local authorities, and a famous Finnish actor, Jasper Pakkonen. Jasper is a strong advocate for rivers, 
and someone that attracts a great deal of interest and coverage throughout Finland and well beyond. In Africa, the hub was centered in Kruger National Park, South Africa, where there was a four-day celebration. The National Museum of Natural History in La Paz, Bolivia, was the continental hub for South America. The Mahir Trust hosted the Asia Hub in the country of India, with two days of events for children and people of many river communities. By the end of World Fish Migration 2018, when the sun set on the islands of Hawaii, there had been over 570 events celebrated in 63 countries around the world. Over 3,000 organizations joined together to find solidarity in their love and work on behalf of rivers. The James River is lucky to have so many amazing partners. There's nothing like seeing a river from the water, feeling the currents, seeing the birds in the floodplain forest. And in Richmond, there's riverside trails that connect to the heart of this vibrant city. This river is alive with fish migrations now, and the city is making the river one of the best places to experience nature, to find the calm and beauty that can seem so remote for way too many people these days. Our organization and Bike Walk RVA and a number of other organizations put um, pressure on the city to really fund that, to make sure that the riverfront was a priority, that it was, was going to be a place where the public come and really enjoy the river and, and, and uh, appreciate this resource that we have. For a long time, um, like many cities around the country, the James had a very polluted downtown area. We had raw sewage in, in the river in the mid-20th century. It wasn't until the Clean Water Act in 1972 that we started to see those kinds of improvements where we weren't dumping raw sewage and other kinds of waste into the river. My, uh, my brother and sister-in-law were, uh, I was asking them to come if they were gonna stop by the Boshers Dam and they're like, Boshers Dam, where, where's Boshers Dam? There's a dam on the James. And just, you know, that idea that they actually cross over the roadway that's right adjacent to the dam probably a couple times a week, and they had no idea that it was even a dam. It was really interesting that the events in Richmond were centered around an existing dam. While dams are almost always a problem for rivers and fish, the tour at Boshers Dam showed us how fish ladders are engineered to help many fish get past. There, they're giving tours so people can see what a fishway is, how it works, how it functions, how it fits into the landscape, and, and how the fish can use that to basically bypass and get around the dam. A lot of smart engineering goes into making fish ladders and fish lifts when dam removal isn't really an option. And while it still makes for a difficult journey for migratory fish, technical fishways can help in some cases to get fish both upstream and downstream to complete their life cycle. This is just one more way in which people can learn uh, about what culverts and dams and, and things like that can do to the species and just the, the food web and uh, how things interact. You might be asking yourself, what exactly is a free-flowing river? For most people, we think of rivers as beautiful places with moving water that transports people and fish, but it's really hard to know what's going on below the waterline. So a free-flowing river is one that's connected in four fundamental ways. It maintains upstream and downstream connectivity so that sediments and water can flow downstream and fish can flow upstream and that's really critical unfortunately barriers like dams can block rivers and stop that connectivity second is their connection laterally 
So the ability of water to move out onto the floodplain and back into the channel. This is really important for sediment flows that flow into floodplains and create habitats and so on on the floodplain. A third way is for rivers to maintain their vertical connectivity. So river, or the river water to be able to move down into the groundwater and into aquifers, which can serve as reservoirs for water for human and environmental use. And then the fourth uh, way is seasonally, for the river to maintain its ebbs and flows over time. Well, fish migration is a natural process. Fish live in rivers and in the ocean and they're always moving around, but they migrate primarily to reproduce, to have their young. So, for example, anadromous species, fish like salmon and steelhead trout, will actually live in the ocean and then they come back into the freshwater rivers where they were born to lay their eggs, to spawn, to have their eggs fertilized. And then the eggs hatch and the juvenile fish grow up in the rivers and then eventually go back out to sea. Fishes, freshwater fishes, they don't have a, a voice. They're living underwater, they're living in a world that people don't experience very often. It's difficult to, to see what's going on underneath uh, the water in freshwater. And people just don't know about them. I mean, and, these, and some of these fish, they're incredible fish that can grow up to 10 feet in length. And some, so you think the Mekong giant catfish, world's largest freshwater fish, and 99% of the people on Earth have never even heard of it. So you have these incredibly large, charismatic, important fish that nobody's ever heard about. So for example, a free-flowing river has a lower temperature, it flows quickly, and fish have evolved in that environment. If you put a dam in, you change that free-flowing river to a slow-moving reservoir. The temperatures go up, the flow of the river is slower, and fish haven't evolved in that environment, so they don't do well in that. The rivers of the world need to be protected for several reasons. We as human beings need it. We need the rivers to provide us with food, for example. It's a basic necessity. And we don't have fisheries if we don't have rivers. Many of the world's most important fisheries depend on free-flowing rivers. We're not only talking about salmon, we're talking about many tropical species as well that, that completely depend on free-flowing moving rivers. Not only do humans need rivers to provide us with food or provide us with experiences around nature, but the globe, the planet needs rivers. Rivers are the veins, the life source of the planet. And humankind has been quite uh, efficient in destroying those veins by damming, by other acts. We've been pretty passionate in, in using our strength and using our force into, uh, into chaining those rivers and essentially destroying them. Man has historically had the urge and the need to chain rivers. When we understood that we can build a dam, all of a sudden the passion to destroy all these rivers, to build them, to use them, to create electricity and other things needed in the uh, industrial world, basically created this big boom of damming every single river. Every water that moves was dammed. The myth of hydropower being clean and green is, is an absurd thought. When you build a dam to create hydropower, essentially you're destroying that river and the whole ecosystem around it. There are no fish moving up and down the river to their migration spots when there's a dam blocking that migration. But also, dams nowadays we know are a huge cause and source of greenhouse emissions, such as methane emissions. So essentially they are a big contributor to climate change. How can you ever call that green or, or clean in terms, of, uh, in terms of being an energy source when it's the complete polar opposite of that? The majority of people in, in the world are not aware of the fact that dams are actually a big source of environmental problems. 
and that's partly because of this very successful advertising campaign of making greenwashing hydropower as as a clean source of energy but luckily nowadays during the only during the last few years people all around the world have started understanding that that dams are actually not not green nor nor clean as a source of energy I was five years old in 1968. That's when Lyndon B. Johnson announced to the nation his imperative to protect our rivers. After hundreds of years of damming them and polluting them, it was time for change. And that started the U.S. rivers on their path to recovery. From this moment, 9.30 a.m., July the 1st, 1999, there was no turning back. Ironically, is progress by going backwards. Back to 1836, the year before the dam was built, first to power a lumber mill and later to provide electricity, which it continued to do until two years ago. When the U.S. government, under pressure from environmentalists, refused to relicense the dam and ordered its removal. Interior Secretary Bruce Babbitt called it an act of restoration, a statement about our capacity to honor and respect God's creation. And the restoration of this river and the fishery is going to provide economic benefits to the people of the Kennebec Valley and the state of Maine that, that we can only dream of at this point. But the end of all that was as simple as sitting on a riverbank on a summer day and letting nature take its course for the first time in 162 years. It's obvious to most of us that dams wipe out fish migrations. We've known this ever since ancient societies first learned how to dam rivers. We live in a time unlike any before us. It's a time when incredibly damaging barriers are just beginning to be removed from many major rivers. We are reconnecting thousands of miles of rivers and streams to the ocean again. For some rivers, this is the first time in over 200 years that fish populations have the chance to grow and expand into this reopened habitat. We're at the Patapsco River. Uh, behind me is the Bodhi Dam, or what's left of it. Uh, a few weeks back, we breached the dam. About a 20-foot section was uh, exploded out, so uh, we were able to kind of dewater the impoundment behind. A lot of the water flushed through, bringing a lot of the sediment with it. Once that was complete, the next few weeks were spent just chipping away at the exposed portions of the rest of the dam, heading out to the other bank. And um, the water just continued to flush, a little bit of a head cut migration, a lot of slumping of the sediments. And now we're ready to do another blast. So it's a pretty exciting day. Um, they've uh, loaded, they're loading actually some explosives right now uh, to, to do another 20 foot section of the dam. So they'll, they'll explode that, they'll remove the debris, and then they'll, they'll repeat that process a few more times to get the remainder of the dam out of the river. This is the downstream impediment, uh, the only downstream impediment from here all the way to the Chesapeake Bay. So this is a, will be a huge migratory fish passage area. American Rivers and their team removed two other dams just upstream of this. So this is just gonna open up a tremendous amount of river for, for native fish and anadromous fish as well to move through the system and uh, just bring life back back to our rivers. Um, flushing the sediment through is something that downstream rivers need. They need some of that sediment at times to help keep their systems a little more active. So they'll be able to start moving up this as soon as the dam's out of it. As far as restored with like revegetation and everything and the sediment settling down, that'll take a little bit longer. The bigger challenge for us is to ensure this appreciation and advocacy for river health and the people that depend on them becomes business as usual. To do this, we need to help expand awareness of river health and use our voices, our votes, and funding to 
to advocate for the freeing of rivers and protecting the precious few rivers that remain intact. That's one reason why I went to Washington, D.C., to meet some of these dedicated people working on this. In 2016, our agency reached the milestone of replacing or upgraded 1,000 culverts for fish passage. And we are planning on restoring another 1,000 culverts by 2020. Then I went to meet with Craig Goodwin. He's the National Aquatic Ecologist for the Natural Resources Conservation Service, which is part of the USDA. Why is World Fish Migration Day important here? Well, we're at the, uh, the very point, in essence, where the, the tide can have an effect upon the river and where, as we start working our way downstream, we go from freshwater to saltwater. These very important areas, like the uh, Chesapeake Bay, these estuaries where these various microenvironments, some salty, some more saline, some less saline, provide a great opportunity for a lot of different habitats for um, both fin fish and shellfish in the area. It's uh, such a privilege and uh, it's so inspiring. You know, here we're in the nation's capital, surrounded by concrete and houses, and this little stream here now has tens of thousands of river herring that come all the way up through the Chesapeake Bay from the high seas of the Atlantic. And they do it every year, whether the water, water is muddy like today or clear or high or low, and it's something that we need to share with the public. The pace of work being done by these federal agencies working in conjunction with environmental organization has been picking up speed this last decade. More removals of delinquent dams, enlarging road stream crossings so that the fish can get into headwaters, and finding ways to re-establish native fish populations when there aren't enough left to do it on their own. In the western U.S., we haven't taken very good care of our, of our freshwater fish. In the Colorado, almost all of the native fish of the lower Colorado are now either gone or endangered. Salmon populations in the Columbia River, in terms of biomass of wild salmon, have declined by uh, probably 90 percent. And so in these rivers in the western U.S., where we've built a lot of dams, the native fish have not fare very well at all. So in my mind, it's a warning. It's especially a warning in other parts of the world where people are very dependent on fish. Because we've seen species extinctions, we've seen huge population declines, and if that happens in areas where most of the population is dependent on fish, there could be serious consequences. From a freshwater biodiversity perspective, there's probably nothing more damaging in these tropical rivers than dams. And so that, I mean, definitely, if I was going to talk with people who were thinking about dams as green energy or thinking about building some of these large dams in high biodiversity areas, I think the first thing I would tell them is that these dams have the potential to cause the extinction of dozens or maybe even hundreds of unique species of fish. But we have to remember that the source of these problems for fish is nearly ubiquitous, and it's a problem that's been around since the Industrial Revolution. In a world where we tend to measure success in economic terms, we've forgotten about some of our intrinsic connections with rivers and with fish. We need to get better at realizing that restored rivers provide a lot of economic value, but they also create much richer ecosystems for all of us to live in, to make healthier, more enjoyable lives. It's great to see the recognition of these values advocated not only by government agencies and nonprofit organizations, but also to see popular culture engaging with the restoration of our ecosystems.
I'm a passionate fly fisherman and I really want my kids and my grandchildren to have a chance to experience the same things I have a chance to experience today. So for the last decade, I've been quite active in a political debate in Finland, talking about how to conserve our fisheries, how to make our fish populations healthier, how to make sure that fish can actually migrate into their spawning grounds. I really wanted to bring World Fish Migration Day into Finland. And I've been teaming up with Mr. Pekka Havisto in Finland, who's our previous Minister of Development, around parliamental events, seminars in the Finnish parliament, where we talk about these things and bring together the leading scientists, the leading activists, and some really influential politicians to talk about how to make sure that the future for our rivers and our fisheries looks, looks better than it does now. And bringing World Fish Migration Day to Finland and creating the European hub for World, World Fish Migration Day on that parliamental seminar was a perfect fit because we can go from local to, uh, to an international platform and combine the forces of these two different events into one. And I believe the, uh, the, the parliamental seminar we arranged was a big success. forgotten about the values of our rivers, the multiple values of our rivers. We think of them as resources to be tapped, but we forget that there are many other values that they provide, from fisheries to spiritual to recreational. All of these multiple values are ones that need to be considered as we're thinking about how we develop our rivers in a way that maintains important um, aspects like migration routes for fish. Protecting and restoring rivers is the most hopeful form of conservation I know. Because you literally can see a river come back to life if you do the right things, if you take out the dam, or you restore the flow, or you stop putting pollution into that river. Those rivers will come back, and they come back amazingly fast. And so, if all the conservation work I've been in, in a, more than 30 years of my career, the most hopeful work is river restoration. I think standing in, in a river that has flown there for thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, almost an eternity, being a part of that moving force just roots you deep down into Mother Earth grounds you and there's something very meditative about those moments when all there is is complete silence you have a raging roaring river the, the sound of the river just blends into this total silence and i think it's something very primitive that comes from thousands of years ago in human dna that we find something really therapeutic in those moments and in that environment I am on the edge of uh, the Boucher's Dam uh, walkway. It's part of the, the fishway structure. Uh, we just finished up our event here celebrating World Fish Migration Day. I think for our first time, it went pretty well. Uh, we are, I think, have the, have the kind of the, the background now and the skills to make this a bigger event the next time it comes around. And uh, just getting the word out to, I mean, each one of them seemed like they walked away saying, wow, I never knew that, or that's really neat. And that's exactly the response that we want to get with something like this. So each one of them is going to go and talk about it. And for the next two years, they can help us build excitement until we have another event here. I think one of the best things was the fish we were able to capture on the boats and the interaction the, the young and old people were able to have with those fish, where uh, the, game, the game representatives were able to hold those fish up, identify them, tell them what they were, a little bit of information about the fish itself and its life in the James River. And then it, they were able to touch the fish. I mean, these fish were big. They were very neat. And I think it was pretty cool for everyone to see that and then be able to talk to the folks who know a little bit about them. Up 
Happy World Fish Migration Day! World Fish Migration Day brings people to rivers with an excitement for restoring them and those massive migrations of fish. When I see kids and adults like me acting like kids, totally engaged and beaming with awe, I realize there's a lot of hope in our rivers. But here we are today, with thousands upon thousands of people, not only connecting with their rivers and celebrating fish, but also connecting with one another. It's through connecting people that we all learn and grow our knowledge base. It's the way we can develop and share solutions for fixing or protecting rivers that are still free flowing. I'm hopeful that connecting around rivers can give us common cause. It can deepen our understanding of each other as well as our connections to the natural world. World Fish Migration Day helps to connect extraordinary humans that are devoting their lives to making the world a better place, one river at a time. And this is what makes me so incredibly hopeful. I'm excited for the future and I'm proud to be a part of this movement. If this isn't something you've heard of or participated in before, I really hope you join us to celebrate the next World Fish Migration Day on May 16, 2020. Just imagine how we can grow the impact of this event even larger. With funding to support more outreach, we can connect to more people on even more rivers and way more countries. We can start engaging people in their communities in a way that could lead to lasting and life-changing impacts. Please join me in celebrating rivers, the fish that swim through them, and the people all around them.
Free-flowing creeks are part of what binds ecosystems together. These waterways are the circulatory systems of our landscapes. There is approximately 67 tributaries in the lower Hudson River watershed. Half of those are dammed. These are not those giant structures out west, the Elwha Dam, the Hoover Dam. These were mill dams, and they were much smaller. The vast majority of these dams are outdated, outmoded, and serve no viable purpose anymore. They're essentially obsolete. We at Riverkeeper feel they should be removed. The first problem with dams is they bisect habitat. They block historic flows of water, they block sediment, and they block nutrient flow. All these are important for food chains all along the reaches. Dams have to be maintained. You have to constantly repair them, and somebody has to pay for that. It's generally more expensive to repair a dam than to remove it. These dams are aging. If you think about a dam and what the life of the dam will be, you have three trajectories. Either you repair and maintain the dam, you remove the dam, or eventually it, it progressively fails and collapses and crumbles on its own. In the estuary program, we believe that dams that aren't serving a purpose anymore are biologically important. We would like to help remove them. What happens when you take the dam away Will there be any water left? Well, all you have to do is go just downstream of any dam or upstream of any dam, and you'll see what used to be there. So take a walk up beyond the pond or down below the dam, and you'll see what is a stream or a river, which essentially is what it used to look like. Not all dams are bad. There's a lot of dams that serve very, very good purposes and are necessary, but We've had over, uh, you know, we've had centuries of dam buildings, and there are some that are anachronistic. There are some that have outlived their usefulness, and there are some that are even hazards. So thinking hard about how we keep streams connected together, thinking hard about right-sizing culverts, about taking down or adjusting dams that may no longer be of use, that's really important both for us as a human society and also for this whole ecosystem of the watershed estuary connection. I've been removing dams for, what, maybe 25, 30 years now. And most of what I'm working on are old relic industrial dams. The industries stopped 50 years ago. And I think most people who think of what I do for a living assume I'm like an explosives expert, that I go and I blow up these dams all the time. But that's not really the case. It's pretty rare that we blow up a dam. Most of the time, we're just bringing in the big yellow equipment we wait till the flows are really, really low in the, in the river for the most part. And then we go in with the mechanical equipment and we slowly lower it while controlling the flows at the same time. We need dams for things like uh, water supply or flood control. Um, but there's a lot of dams in the rivers that aren't serving a purpose anymore. There's a lot that have just are remnants of this industrial legacy. It's interesting to think what now looks kind of like a grown over forest um, had a lot of structures here at one point, had a lot of buildings, had people taking their lunch, had, you know, with their lunch pails and everything else. But, but now it's been kind of just left. Some of the dams have already collapsed and then some haven't. And so we get this kind of mix match of history on these sites. So this barrier is quite a bit smaller than the one we were just at, but this is actually the first barrier on the system. So right now, this might as well be Hoover Dam to the fish. 
get up to the base of this, and we can actually see herring at the base right now. They get stopped right here. They never make it up to the base of the next dam. In tracking some of the case histories of our losses of these fish in rivers, like the Susquehanna River, for instance, which was the premier shad river on the East Coast, those populations went from the tens of millions to less than 100 some years reaching the spawning grounds. That's a five order of magnitude decline. When the colonists first came here from Europe, they were blown away by what they saw in our fresh waters. Remember that Europeans were coming from a continent, even in the 1600s, that had been heavily overfished, uh, over timbered, just overused environmentally for, for centuries. The Europeans were astounded by what they saw. Uh, the, the quotations are actually quite inspiring to see. It, it's, they're not quantitative, but they tell you that they were simply wowed by, by what they saw. They talked about walking dry shot across the backs of these fishes, which is an exaggeration, but it just tells you that there were an awful lot of fish there in those days. One of the cool uh, things that if you're really lucky, you might get to see even here in the Hudson Valley are small eels climbing up waterfalls or the faces of dams, trying to get upstream, trying to find habitats where they can settle in and mature. And it doesn't seem possible that these fish are climbing up wet rocks, but I've seen it myself and it's a pretty awesome sight. Even though eels can, can sometimes get around or ascend dams, anytime you have a barrier to migration, you're going to be limiting some of those animals, some of that connectivity between upstream and downstream. And remember, even though, yeah, sure, a few eels can get above those dams, that's a food source for the upriver ecosystem that those dams may be preventing and limiting. Another factor that I think does not get enough attention is that many of the dams in the Hudson Valley and the entire Northeast are aging and are already beyond their expected life period. So we should be thinking about the future of these rivers also in relation to the sheer safety factor of these dams, which uh, are not going to last forever and have a finite existence. You would have thought we'd had a uh, full life cycle process, an economic process that included that full life cycle for a dam, but that's not what happened. So we had something built, we had it used, it served an economic purpose, and, and it was built on a public trust resource. So it was built on a resource that was for everyone. But then there was no funding source put in to the end of its life, to what was gonna happen in the end. And unlike a building kind of rotting in place, let's say, in the center of a town um, that really becomes a nuisance and a hazard. Uh, and then at some point, the owner of that building is really responsible for taking that out. That's not what has happened on rivers. We've had these just left uh, 50, 100 years ago and just kind of rotting on their own. And the industry is long gone. These are the ghosts of capitalism past. People made their fortunes and abandoned them. They are now an ecological problem that we have to resolve. In places like Newburgh, there are a series of dams, and it could all be within a few blocks, one after another. Each person, each mill wanted a dam, and they wanted their certain amount of water. And so these now represent uh, bona fide obstacles. So if you remove one, there's one behind it. And then there's another, and then there's another. So we have to engage the community one dam at a time. A lot of the films and a lot of the publicity about dam removal are the big West Coast dams. And they're huge dams, Hoover Dam and others. Huge dams. And a 10-foot dam blocks fish just as much as a 500-foot dam. You can prioritize dams 
and sort them a whole bunch of different ways. You could sort them by which is the most hazardous. You could sort them by which dam owner is most likely to let the dam go. Of course, the best way for the fish's point of view is to say which dams are going to benefit aquatic life the most. This dam is, is gonna be extraordinarily expensive to fix when the time comes to fix it. But sooner or later, the fish will win. Sooner or later, it's coming down because nobody's gonna spend $10 million to fix this dam. Not gonna happen. And uh, so sooner or later, the fish are gonna win. It's just a matter of time. Kill, which is about three miles south of Troy, which is the end of the estuary. It was a heavy industry here. And this little tributary comes in from the east. And for 15 years, and I'd been looking at a dam that I thought was a concrete wall, immovable structure. You know, we've been talking to New York State DEC estuary program for years about their initiative to take down barriers for fish migration. And in May 2016, the city of Troy came down here and it took a loader and a cutting torch and the barrier that had been there for 85 years is gone. Five days after it came down, they put a camera in the water right here behind me and there were herring coming up the wine is killed. They had reached the spawning ground and they were going to fulfill their destiny. And when you think about what's happening here in these migrations, is these fish are born in the upper Hudson. They had left when they were this big years ago. They came back on faith, driven by forces that are beyond all of our understanding. And they found that fast water coming over the dam. And fast water to them says, a, a tributary. We want to go in there. We want to get above the tide. We want to get away from the predators. So for 85 years, their parents, their grandparents, their great-grandparents, their great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandparents had been coming up and knocking on the door at that dam. Nobody home. A lot of times, people thank us at Riverkeeper. You know, they'll say, oh, thank you. You're doing God's work. Well, when we took down that barrier, we were part of it. We felt like we were doing God's work. It's a... Uh, a wondrous thing to be involved in something like that. Um, it was the first barrier in the history of the Hudson Valley removed expressly for fish passage. The dams were all built one at a time. They're gonna come down one at a time.
in describing the Herring River, the first thing that comes to my mind is that it's wild. You have to see it to understand just how special it is. It's almost hypnotizing to watch the wind blow, the marsh grass. Salt marshes are just gorgeous places to kayak or canoe through. They call them the nurseries of the ocean. Herring River is a 1,100-acre riverine salt marsh that developed about 2,000 years ago. Historically, it was incredibly productive and valuable until we made the ill-fated decision to dike it off back in the early 1900s. So you can imagine that if you were to cut off the tides, you would get really radical changes in the ecology. Its most important role is to provide the linkage between salt water and fresh water. And when you put something like a dike in between the two, you have just defeated its fundamental purpose for existence. Restricting tides in a wetland has major ecological consequences. It completely alters the, the ecology. It prevents fish from migrating. It causes the assemblage of plants and animals to change. Right now, it is a clogged and invasive species filled body of water. It was diked 100 years plus ago that dramatically changed the parameters, the water quality, the marine life, the value of the wetlands entirely. It's deteriorating, it has very low oxygen. It's even tough for the herring that we do have to get up the river. It's kind of a mess. So we're looking to clean up that mess and restore the estuary to its prior beauty and grandeur, and also doing great ecological benefit at, at the same time. So the dike itself, which requests the dike road, will be open from its existing 18 feet up to about 165 feet with control gates so that the tide can be managed and returned incrementally into the Herring River Basin. There will also be uh, structures at the intersection of Mill Creek and the Herring River as well as Poldike Creek to allow control and to prevent damage to structures in those sub-basins. Poldike Road, County Road, Bonbrook Road will be raised in sections so that they will not be flooded. It's got a lot of science behind it, and it's a very conservative approach. The Herring River Restoration Project is probably one of the most studied potential projects that I have ever encountered. When you see the level of professional scientists and naturalists and biologists, and the importance to the Gulf of Maine and feeding the cod, it's a no-brainer. The restoration is going to benefit everybody, it seems to me. We're going to have Tremendous development of habitat, both salt marsh and freshwater marsh. The recovery of the fin fishery as water quality improves, the reduction in nuisance mosquito breeding. Enhanced habitat for birds. People will be able to boat in places where right now is, is shrubs and grasses. I really look forward to catching a bass in the river again. I used to do it. We'll have a lot more herring who can make it up to the spawning ponds. It'd be healthy economically and environmentally to have that dike open. We think the restoration of the river would help us because obviously the inundation of salt water back into our natural creeks and drainage systems would help us get rid of Phragmites. It has had a lot of citizen and stakeholder input. You have two local communities, Truro and Wellfleet, coming together and the state is actively involved. And then at the federal level you have active participation by the Cape Cod National Seashore and participation and support from Congressman Keating. People in Truro understand that this is the right thing to do for our fragile environment. It's the heart of the tourist attraction to this area. I would like us to be on the map for this project for the next 50, 60 to 75 years. We had a huge asset here that 110 years ago we compromised. It would be nice to have it back. Turn on the seawater and nature will fix it. However we leave the planet is up to us. We're gonna either leave it better or worse. It never gets left the same. And I think it's up to all of us, individually and collectively, to try to see what we can do to leave it better.
tributary holds a special place in my heart in that we were literally standing on the banks of the creek staring at the culvert when out of the, the depth of the plunge pool at the base of the culvert, two adult coho who were trying to make their way to their spawning grounds were stuck. Both of these fish jumped up multiple times trying to get into that culvert. The Cold Water Connection campaign is working to remove the barriers on the Olympic Peninsula to bring salmon and steelhead back home. 50% of the state's non-listed populations under the Federal Endangered Species Act call the Olympic Peninsula home. It is a salmon stronghold. We are what some consider a climate refuge. If you look at climate projections into the 2080s, we're gonna have some of the coldest and cleanest waters left for salmon in the Pacific Northwest. We have a lot of incredible habitat, both within the National Forest and Olympic National Park, but we really need to shore up the strongholds of the Olympic Peninsula by opening up these barriers, removing these blockages so that salmon and steelhead can, can get back into their home habitats. And this culvert is acting like a barrier, like, just like a dam would. And fish cannot go upstream to get to colder water, to get to their, their summer refuge. So water temperature can be an issue too, but this, this is a classic example of what we're trying to fix. Uh, and the first thing we're doing with this project is identifying these barriers that are not yet documented. So we're walking all the county roads and basically identifying every culvert we come across and we'll measure those. We want to make sure these fish have freedom to migrate up and downstream as they want. So far we've surveyed 440. We probably have another couple hundred to go. We're finding dozens of undocumented barriers. In Washington state as a whole, there are over 20,000 documented barriers and even more that are undocumented. On the Olympic Peninsula alone, we have over 4,000 documented culverts and barriers to fish migration, many dams that are impeding the passage of our salmon and steelhead. We are trying to be strategic in the barriers that we're removing to ensure that we're prioritizing re-establishing connection to some of the coldest water refugias that we have still available. This is Colby Creek and it's a pretty large tributary to the Dickey River and we've got four culverts down here that are blocking a, a couple miles of habitat upstream here. Rainier Inc, the landowner, has agreed to let us pull these four culverts out and leave this as an open channel so this stream, Colby Creek, will be uh, restored back to its most natural habitat it can be in. And all the trees that are getting removed that are hazard trees for the project will be placed in stream for more cover for the salmon and to produce a more complex habitat. This is a habitat for juvenile, adult, and all life stages of salmon here. These little guys, as soon as this culvert is out of here, they'll be able to access upstream as well, and they just have uh, miles and miles of, of habitat opportunity up there. And, and more specifically, here they have a nice channel to be in, but upstream they have access to wetlands and more off-channel refugia for them to be able to uh, survive to, to smolthood and, and be able to go out to the ocean. You know, we're making jobs both at the level for me as a, as a sponsor of the project and helping landowners get funding, and then as having the contractors do it. And then after the contractors get out of there, we'll have kids come volunteer from the school and do plantings. Projects like these, these passage opening projects, are immediate successes. We see salmon utilizing them as soon as they're coming back the next season, and oftentimes juveniles are utilizing them immediately after the barrier is removed. It's very, very low input for a very high output for salmon habitat. The Cold Water Connection campaign is bringing together partners on the Olympic Peninsula to remove fish barriers, ultimately reconnecting 150 miles, allowing fish to 
get back home to some of the most important cold, clean water reaches. Watershed restoration is not only working to recover our wild salmon and steelhead populations, it's also helping to recover our coastal communities and our coastal economies. I really believe that the Olympic Peninsula is one of our last best hopes for salmon and steelhead in the Pacific Northwest, and we have an opportunity to get recovery right here, um, to restore these populations to something more resemblant of historic health. But we need to get to work. <laughs>